Hello and welcome to Bloomberg TV India's special series in the run-up to Budget 2015, Ideas for Transforming India. I am Siddharth Zarabi. This show focuses on the big picture plan that can fundamentally transform the trajectory of India's economy and the fortunes of 1.2 billion people. Earlier on in this series, we spoke about how the country needs an integrated energy policy given the trouble surrounding both the power and the oil and gas sector. The Narendra Modi government believes the solution may lie in a big thrust on renewable energy for which massive targets have been set out. One hundred thousand megawatt. That's the ambitious target set by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government for renewable energy. This requires a dramatic scale up from the current installed capacities for both wind and solar power. While the domestic wind power industry has been finding its feet in the last decade, solar power has been largely reliant on imports. The last few months have seen a significant policy push to drive solar capacity higher. The government has announced support of 1,000 crore rupees to central public sector units to set up overgrid connected solar photovoltaic power projects of over 1,000 megawatt. In addition to this, there is a plan to set up 25 solar parks with a capacity of 500 megawatts each. These solar parks will be set up in collaboration with state governments and agencies of their choice. The solar park plan will get 4,000 crore rupees in financial support from the center. The defense and paramilitary establishments have been asked to set up solar projects of 300 megawatt as well. Reports suggest that this renewable energy push is being given policy backing by reviving the long-pending renewable energy bill. This bill seeks to plug the loopholes in the Electricity Act of 2013 and the Energy Conservation Act of 2001. The bill also seeks to create a national authority on renewable energy with similar bodies at the state, district and village levels. India also secured funding for its clean energy program from the U.S. Exim Bank during the recent visit of U.S. President Barack Obama. The big breakthrough during that visit, of course, was in nuclear energy, where both India and the United States moved closer to making the Indo-U.S. nuclear deal operational. But on that front, too, the action now shifts from the government to companies, which continue to remain cautious on pouring billions of dollars into India. In the absence of quick movement on nuclear power, the onus stays on wind and solar power to step up to the task. Joining me now to talk about the potential to dramatically ramp up India's renewable energy production, Suman Sinha, Chairman and CEO of Renew Power, and Arvind Mahajan, Head of the Government and Infrastructure Practice at KPMG. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us on uh, the show. There's clearly a change uh, at least as far as the policy approach goes, it's not just about climate change, but the recognition within this government in the past few months that we have seen uh, about a major thrust towards renewable energy. And as we know, uh, that would perhaps be the long-term uh, safeguard when it comes to ensuring uh, energy security uh, for this country, which uh, imports much of its uh, crude oil uh, dependence uh, annually. But, but that's the big picture, to focus on the specific ideas and suggestions uh, that can go into policy and that can hopefully uh, provide inputs to the government to take necessary steps. I'm going to first ask Mr. Suman Sinha uh, to come up with his first idea for the debate today and then go uh, across to uh, Mr. Mahajan uh, for specific ideas on this sector. Mr. Sinha, it's over to you. Your first big idea when it comes to renewable energy. Well, you know, uh, Siddharth, thanks a lot for inviting me to the show. I think there are a few things that the government needs to do to really try to meet their uh, fairly large target uh, of 100,000 megawatts of solar and 60,000 megawatts of wind by 2022. I think the first and most important issue is that, um, you know, ultimately power is bought by the states. And state distribution companies, as we know, are not really in good financial health. So I think somewhere, somehow, the government needs to uh, improve the financial health of distribution companies. Uh, unfortunately, this is a state subject, and therefore, uh, the central government can only incentivize and can only cajole, but the real decision lies in the hands of the state governments. So somewhere, somehow, as I said earlier, the government has to improve the finances of the distribution companies. The second thing linked to that is the attractiveness of buying renewable energy. Today, renewables cost about, you know, wind costs about 6 rupees, solar costs about 650 to 7 rupees, which in most states' point of view, 
is higher than where they can buy conventional power. So the government has to work on figuring out how to lower the cost of, an, of, of, these, of the renewables and thereby make it more attractive to state governments, which as I said earlier, are cash-strapped. Um, and the easiest way of doing that, to some extent, is by reducing the financing cost. And so therefore, given where you know, we are borrowing at 12%, 13% interest rates even today, uh, there has to be a way for us to you know, move that cost down to 8 or 9%. And if we can do that, I can assure you that the cost of renewables will come down and be totally competitive with where conventional power is at today. And on a levelized basis, it will be very significantly inside where con conventional power will be over a 20, 25 year basis. So I think if I had to really pick and choose one or two critical issues, I would say improve the health of the distribution companies and make renewables more attractive by bringing down the cost of financing and thereby bringing down the cost of renewables. Okay, uh, a good points there, Suman, because uh, the theme that you have picked up at the very start in terms of the idea, uh, uh, you know, uh, our viewers know that in uh, other parts of this series, uh, that theme has come up and will perhaps uh, keep on coming up, the health of the distribution companies. And uh, you know uh, that uh, in the last uh, uh, lag of uh, the UPA government in the last years, really, uh, there was an uh, effort to do one more bailout, so to say, of uh, the distribution companies. But uh, that's a problem uh, that is perennial and perhaps needs specific steps and urgent steps. And the second point that you make about uh, reducing the cost, uh, the interest cost, uh, that is also something that the overall economy is grappling with. Uh, those are the two key ideas that you uh, have put up here uh, first on in the debate. Let me go across to Mr. Mahajan for his suggestions around this theme. Mr. Mahajan? Yeah, uh, what I would say, uh, what I, I, the, the government has set out a very uh, ambitious uh, target, as we all know. And uh, to make that happen, clearly there is uh, huge investments to be made, uh, at least about 100 billion uh, plus, uh, including on transmission, maybe another 10 billion. So at least 110 billion over the next seven years. Uh, and therefore, financing cost, as Sumanth mentioned, is really going to be one of the elements. But I think the second area which, uh, which I think uh, needs to be addressed is, uh, is make in India, actually. And uh, while this is a longer term uh, uh, exercise, uh, there, uh, you know, it's, there is a need to link what the government is doing in, in the area of uh, solar power, particularly uh, uh, in terms of making in India, uh, which means going up the, across the value chain to make sure that making in India is becoming competitive. And uh, financing aspects, which I think uh, the, uh, is one aspect of it, but I think creating clusters uh, for uh, uh, several countries have created, uh, uh, you know, basically solar clusters which go upstream and and to do that uh, uh, you know certain incentives which will enable that to happen uh, uh, is something which is, is is certainly required at the same time while the government has done something in terms of correcting the vertic you know the inverted duty structure there's probably something more to be done in terms of uh, you know manufacturing india in terms of both the direct as well as uh, uh, indirect taxes uh, you know in, in in that respect uh, so what I would say is that, uh, you know, to get the okay, cost uh, down. Hold, hold, hold that thought. Uh, 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 Arvind, hold that thought because, uh, you know, we need to break this up really for the benefit of our viewers. So uh, w the third point that you added really, if, if I was to say as the third idea, apart from discoms, a lower cost of uh, financing, you spoke about the need to encourage mm -hmm. domestic manufacturing uh, of the key components and products that will go into the overall, uh, you know, build up of renewable energy. Uh, and then you moved on to uh, customs duties and that. Let me, let me uh, ask you to step back for a moment and give a comparison if you can at this stage. And I'll uh, go across to Sumanth also on that point. Um, what is the domestic capacity that exists in this regard? How ahead or behind our view of comparable economies when it comes to this? Give, give our viewers a, 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 a global sense at this point of time in the debate. Arvind. You know, there are certain elements uh, which, uh, you know, to, it's not automatic that you, uh, by creating solar parks, you will get investments in. There is a, an, uh, there is a need for us to create a long-term framework for uh, incentivizing solar uh, or 
uh, wind for that matter, which will, you know, either through, uh, uh, you know, showing what you're going to do in terms of, let's say, feeding tariff type of regime or enforcing a renewable purchase obligation, which gives comfort to, you know, the investors as well as financiers and developers to make some of these investments because we are really talking about very sizable amount of investments over the next seven years. So while one element of it is to create incentives to, okay. uh, you know, basically manufacturing incentives, that's not going to be sufficient. Uh, you know, taxation incentive that's not going to be sufficient unless you also create uh, sufficient, uh, you know, address some of the points which Surman talks about the ability of the uh, uh, the state uh, discoms to buy, as well as uh, uh, you know some sort of uh, incentive, long-term incentive framework for the viability of you know develop, uh, developers, you know, in that sense. Okay, uh, all right, Arvind. Uh, Suman, my question to you once again: uh, a sense, if you can provide uh, to our viewers of the current existing capacity, and perhaps in percentage terms, if you could tell us uh, where do we stand. Uh, Vis-a-vis -vis China, because we know that the uh, ma uh, that the most massive installed capacity in this regard would be China. But still, for the viewers, where does it stand now, and therefore, how much can uh, incentive-driven approach uh, work for this sector? So let me take two sectors separately. One is wind. The first is wind. In wind, uh, we have a uh, manufacturing yeah. capacity domestically of about eight to ten thousand megawatts. So I don't think there's any issue on the wind side, the sufficient capacity, the cost of production of wind turbines in India with fairly localized supply chains, very mature uh, technologies is fairly robust. We do not import a single uh, megawatt of wind turbines from overseas. So I think as far as wind is concerned, there is no real issue. Now let's come to solar. Solar clearly is a bigger thrust area of the government with the intention of doing 100,000 megawatts of pretty much new capacity over the next seven years. Today, the manufacturing capacity in India is less than 1,000 megawatts uh, annually. Uh, so you can imagine that today, the installed capacity uh, is woefully inadequate to cater to our requirements. In terms of pricing, uh, we can import solar modules from China at about 55 cents a watt. Uh, Indian manufacturing costs are about 20% uh, higher than that. So uh, Indian manufacturing therefore needs to somehow find a way of reducing the cost of production and only if it does that will it become competitive. Uh, we are not really importing a lot of modules right now from the U.S. And so therefore, exim financing from the U.S. in some senses is not really very useful because it's not really, you know, we're not really importing any equipment from there. Um, and so therefore, we really do need to encourage more okay. manufacturing in solar in India because over the next seven years, we really can't be importing, you know, 10 to 15 billion dollars of solar panels uh, every year from China. And so therefore, we do have to encourage domestic manufacturing. And I agree with Arvind's point where he says that it's not just a question of giving incentives to manufacturing. Ultimately, manufacturing will have to stand on its own feet. Uh, the more important thing is to give visibility for right. long-term demand. And that today, while the government has a target of 100,000 megawatts in solar, that visibility of demand needs to become more robust, uh, more well understood, and uh, has to become more tangible. And only once that happens will people start investing, you know, a lot of money in manufacturing in India. And only then will you start seeing costs come down. And so therefore there is some gap between the government's announced targets and the policies that it still needs to come out with, which will then encourage a lot of manufacturing under make in India. So I think that really is the gap that still needs to be bridged over the next several months. I would imagine the government is probably working on that right now. We need to take a quick break on this episode of Ideas for Transforming India. Suman Sinha and Arvind Mahajan stay with us on the other side. Welcome back to Ideas for Transforming India. Today we have been discussing how the Narendra Modi government can scale up the country's renewable energy production. I still have with me Suman Sinha of Renew Power and Arvind Mahajan of KPMG. At this stage, let me now ask uh, you, Arvind, uh, about what would be a very bad idea uh, for this government to consider uh, as it looks at a thrust towards renewable energy. We have spoken about uh, the better suggestions or the better ideas, 
what would be an absolute no no you know to make this happen as i said uh, it requires a lot uh, having set the you know the if you like the the vision there is a lot of things needs to be done in terms of one the policy framework which is uh, as suman says hopefully the government is working on some of the aspects uh, nitty gritties relating to the uh you know both the uh, manufacturing part as well as a framework which will give uh comfort from a demand perspective which uh, from a longer term uh perspective and some of that really relates to if you like enforcing of uh you know basically things which are already there in terms of let's say renewable purchase obligations states many states are not yet gone do that path uh issues relating to uh let's say they've got a concept of renewable energy certificates which again is not really been uh you know basically put into enforcement so there has to be and to some extent it is linked to the issue of financial health of the discoms and there has to be some mechanism by which let's say the government uh, provides incentives to states which are moving uh ahead in in the path of some of these uh, you know basically encouraging renewables sumant let me uh, uh, request you to provide us a clear set of no nos as you can with the only point from my side uh, that at a recent discussion uh, uh, that that we hosted uh, the idea about how in the uh, era of uh, commanding height of psus you had a national thermal power corporation you had a national a uh, hydro uh, power corporation you now have a solar energy corporation but uh, is is therefore the need to do it on a very centralized basis gigantic basis the way to go or would you want it to be done in a smaller uh, approach with the private sector leading uh, the charge really as far as renewable energy goes so two questions the no nos and then hopefully if you can answer that part too Okay, Sudhir. But clearly, the no-nos for me are um, policy flip-flops. Uh, you know, the previous government did put in place a certain regime. Uh, this government, while it can tweak uh, some of the policies, cannot whole whole-scale change those because that just leads to too much policy change, which ultimately is anathema to any investor, whether for domestic or foreign. Uh, for example, uh, you know, state governments change. They should not change the entire policy of procurement because. for example if i am doing a project and that project spills over from one year to the other if a new government comes in and they totally change the policy then what happens to the investment that i am in the process of making i can't suddenly not make the investment and we've seen that happening uh, when state governments change sometimes even when bureaucrats change so for example a discom head will change he'll come up with a totally new policy so those kind of policy flip flops ultimately you know are very very damaging to uh, investors like us you know because we can't we can't change our own uh execution processes on a dime the second is at a macro level for example in when we have a feed in tariff mechanism now i i hope that the government does not think about changing that uh, that feed in tariff mechanism because that has been arrived at after a lot of thought and and debate and so on and that's really the policy that world over everybody all the other countries are following as well and that's resulted in the most amount of capacity add now they shouldn't change those kind of things similarly gbi was announced for 5 years or up to 15000 megawatts whichever comes earlier again they shouldn't suddenly in the middle of the process change that because again it leads to uncertainty in the minds of investors and then you're looking at attracting so much more capital you can't just be changing policies because what is the guarantee that in future therefore when a new government comes in after this one goes that again policies will not change or a new minister comes in policies will not change so i think that policy stability is a very very important thing and i think that is really one area where the government has to really be very careful um the second question that you asked me on national thermal power corporation and the other national uh, the psus i totally agree with you siddharth i think that you know philosophically uh, this government has to at some point think about uh, enunciating its its views on public sectors in general you know if you're going to use the public sector to meet all your targets that's fine as long as public sector is efficient and is is doing things in a proper manner but but given given some of the inefficiencies that that exist uh the question is uh, philosophically is the private sector not in a better position or better place to execute some of these uh, targets or these plans and so therefore the government has to move into a facilitation role as opposed to into a role where they're pushing large public sector units to achieve their objectives because then it defeats the very purpose of uh, minimal government and maximum gov- maximum governance uh, it also 
defeats the philosophy of the government has no business being in, in, in business. So, you know, somehow those two statements and philosophies Surely don't from an stand assessment well, point of view, uh, Sumant, you, what is the current yeah. status that you see yeah. uh, of the maturity of the private sector cycle? Uh, 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 how mature is the private sector industry when it comes to renewable energy on a timeline basis? You know, 20 years ago, the maturity of the telecom sector providers, the private licenses and how they grew up. Uh, uh, can you sort of uh, draw a comparison at all? Well, today I would say that there are a number of private sector companies that have got into the renewable energy space, both from manufacturing and from a uh, IPP standpoint. And you have to give this sector a chance to grow. And I think there are there is a lot of talent that has gone in. There's a lot of capital that has gone in. And there is no reason why these companies, given the proper environment, given the proper ecosystem, uh, cannot scale themselves up very significantly and really help the government achieve these targets. Now. The question really is, we've got National Thermal Power Corporation, uh, we've got NHPC, uh, should these companies play a role as well? Yeah, perhaps they should play a role. The question only is, um, you know, at some level, are they the primary providers of that capacity ad or are they just one of the providers of the capacity ad? And as long as they are just meeting their own business requirements and their own, you know, protecting their own business situation, I'm fine with that. But they should not become the primary uh, methods or mechanisms to achieve the targets. Arvind, would you agree uh, if at all I were to take off from what Suman said and propose it as an idea that should we codify our renewable energy policies? Should they perhaps be uh, become an act of parliament, so to say, where the macro framework as far as the laws are concerned gets codified with hopefully minimal leeway left to the center uh, and if the states were to also adopt similar laws uh, with regard to some tinkering, should this be codified? Would that approach uh, work and provide greater confidence to investors who will come in on a life cycle of 15 to 20 years at least? So I don't think you necessarily need to uh, uh, put it into an act of parliament per se, but I do think that there is a need for a framework which is... Uh, uh, which needs to articulate what exactly is the uh, you know long term approach and two three areas which they definitely need and it's not just the approach but the enforcement of it as i said uh, you know to some extent i think one idea which is already exists in the area of uh, wind which is the feeding tariff regime is something which uh, the government should adopt in the solar area as well and uh, you know and many countries uh, have done that uh, you know, across the uh, across the world, and uh, while uh, and if they do that with a sort of uh, you know basically a framework which says, okay, this is the type of tariff which will be there over the next uh, 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 next x number of years, and this is the way we will recalibrate this periodically, keeping in view these considerations. If a framework can be created, it will give uh, investors as well as developers and financiers, much greater, uh, uh, you know, basically comfort. And clearly that obviously has to be also uh, endorsed by the, the states because okay. finally, uh, you know, uh, all these projects will come okay. up at the state level. Uh, and I would just want to add one other aspect related to okay. uh, something uh, which is slightly different from what we're currently being uh, addressed, which is really the, uh, and this is particularly more from a solar perspective, is really providing incentives to, uh, you know, if you like, uh, consumers, retailer, retail people uh, to actually adopt rooftop solar in much greater extent than than they have in the past. That could also be something which can really transform the adoption of uh, solar in the country. But for that to happen, there will be need for uh, net metering as well as some incentives up front, as has been done in U.S. and other countries, to enable some of these, uh, uh, you know, some of the re you know, consumers to actually uh, basically, uh, you know, take up rooftop solar installations. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for all your inputs and suggestions that have come in. Uh, that's all the time we have for right now on this show. We shall keep focusing on each key area of the economy that needs radical change to make the 21st century India's very own. Keep watching this space through the month.